Via, via telephone, Delegate Patrick McGeehan. I call him. I have to redo this because you're, you disappeared the last time. Five-minute Patty or Chill the Irishman. Pat, good morning. How are you? Jeez, good morning, <laughs> Rob. How you doing? Good to have you along for the ride, Patrick. So Yeah, yeah. I hate to bother you with the mundane, but the governor yesterday did say, I want a – there's enough in the – in the triggering mechanism for a four to five percent state income tax cut, I'm going to call the Senate and the House back in and challenge them to find another five percent to make it another ten percent tax cut. Can you do that, Pat? I mean, you know, you know, health, you know, conservative Republicans love a healthy uh, tax cut. Um, you know, most of us really love to cut taxes. Uh, caught me off guard. Um, I've really been just sort of holed up in my personal library, just trying to work on a uh, the the intro to the intro for this uh, prospectus from this dissertation. So uh, I won't bore you with that, but I've sort of been disconnected, and I heard about it and uh, dug into the details last night. You know. I mean, I would love to um, cut additional taxes above and beyond what the automatic triggers were to tax reform that passed, you know, recently. Um, you know, I'm just I'm just a little bit concerned that we might be jumping the gun here. Um, you know, I have to figure out the numbers. You know, we're going into likely a special session to deal with the surplus revenue from this past fiscal year and. You know, some of the numbers in the surplus of the surplus revenue um, were being reported are a little bit exaggerated. I think the real surplus is about 590 million, and it's not. Uh, I think it's being reported as maybe 826 million. Uh, there are multiple base expenses that grow the base by roughly well, well over 320 million. Um, uh, and this, these are different expenditures that we have obligations to. For instance, the Hope Scholarship. And uh, come twenty twenty six, that becomes universal and that's that's about two hundred million dollars. Uh, you know, in addition to what we have now on the base budget. We got PEIA, that's probably gonna be another sixty one million going up. And you know, we have these uh what say I think third grade teachers aides, that's gonna be on top of this is base you know, budget building. That's $33 million, $34 million, something like that. We have uh, many more other expenditures. Behavioral Health Center legislation we passed back in 2022. I think that's $25 million. Let's see. Then we, uh, you know, we had the, uh, the, you know, the tax cut for, for seniors. That was, uh, you know, $10 million. We cut that total, roughly. You know, and then the, uh, the triggers for the personal income tax cut will be around 88 to 96 million dollars you know less and uh so you know we need to pull uh shoot maybe around 800 million dollars and to pull down the 7 billion of available roads bridges sewer water funds over the next several years so there's a lot of expenses and uh, base building to the budget that is going to be coming online in the next few years and, you know, we're on track with, with some pretty good forecasts we've been making since, uh, you know, 2021 or so. Um, you know, the continued tax cuts um, controlled for, or for inflation, I think we'll be able to deal with, deal with that. But, you know, I just remain cautiously optimistic that all the, you know, leg legacy industries and the new investments uh, in our state will scale up. But uh, we need to be controlling spending growth and, and investing in ourselves that that sort of help um, that sort of uh, you know help uh, our help increase basically the tax base. I would I would say so. I'm a little bit nervous uh, about jumping the gun when we don't really have uh, a firm sort of big picture yet in the in the out years two three years with all these but all this legislation and all these moving parts um, um, that are going to cost a lot of money and then we've cut some other taxes and we'll bring in a little bit less revenue so 
it's a dynamic situation, as you know, uh, 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 in human societies, in the uh, economic realm especially. And uh, we just don't know. So, you know, I'm glad that the uh, triggers were met and we're going to uh, reduce the burden of taxation on our folks. Um, I'm all for uh, going above and beyond in the special session if the governor wants to place an additional tax cut there. I just want to be cautious. I just want to make sure we deliberate, get together, and make sure the numbers work and we're not putting ourselves in a very dangerous predicament where we, as the state uh, government, can't uh, you know deliver the essential uh, needs for 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 our people. And so, um, so I guess you know I just. I don't have anything really interesting to say beyond I just think prudence is very key. So if it works out and I think the numbers, you know, add up and we can do this, that's great. Another point I just want to make is that uh, obviously we know we're in a very heavily monetary inflationary environment. And a lot of the uh, excess revenue that we're bringing in, um, I think, reflects this sort of inflation. So. Um, um, a lot of the people that, a lot of the, let's say, institutional organizations that receive this new money, and I'll just put it uh, straightforward, like uh, the new money that's being printed out of thin air over the last several years, um, state governments are, are first to receive some of that uh, through the, you know, Medicaid uh, and Medicare uh, programs, uh, and then other industries receive that money first before it filters out into the larger population. And so some of what we're seeing uh, in the surplus money just reflects the monetary expansion from Washington, D.C. So, um, you know, that's a lot of information I just spit out. So I just think we need to really be prudent, take uh, everything into uh, account. And uh, I'll be meeting with the speaker later this afternoon after I get off the phone with you. I've got to make the drive from Chester to Charleston um, to meet with him for about an hour to go over several things. But, uh, um, you know, I have this wonderful phenomenon that I'm not used to here, Rob. It's called summer. Ever since I uh, took a new line in my profession, I uh, teach uh, uh, Catholic school now. Um, I don't know what to do with myself. So (laughs) I've been (laughs) able to put some of this together. And uh, anyway, so... Well, yes, I'm all well, for it. Hang out there um, because I just want to make sure we're prudent. Jonathan has a question for you. Jonathan, Pat, Jonathan sure, Bodwell. Um, I mean, you, you just take you take that overall, and you take the amount of people in West Virginia. It works out to about three hundred twenty-five dollars a person. Um, yep. It would be much better, I believe, as you had said, to be prudent and uh, look at building our tax base and look at you know spending spending money to add to our to our state. Because we right. don't know if this money is going to keep up. We don't know if these budget surplus are going to keep up with inflation and everything else. It's much harder to, if you give a tax cut, it's much harder to to take it back when you need to in a few years. I mean, we've we've been so we've been so fiscally responsible in this state, so much more than you know pretty much every other state in the country or most of them. And and I think that's I mean our legislature's done a phenomenal job and and jumping, jumping into giving a bunch of money back that may not make a difference because it's not going to be that much for anyone, as opposed yeah. to keeping our f- state fiscally sound. I think makes makes more sense. You make some very good points, and that's right. You know, that's, that's spot on. We do need to be fiscally responsible, and sometimes that means we can't do things, um, not in a drastic manner, but we, we, we can't just do things that, that seem very good and positive at the time. Uh, you know, also we're going to be, um, receiving a new administration come the end of the year. And you're right. You know, let's say we go through with more tax cuts on the income tax and, and, and I can't stand the income tax. I mean, I, you're talking to a man or a guy who's, um, you know, introduced a, a bill every year I've been in the legislature to abolish the income tax completely. And I uh, usually just did that. Uh, this sort of became tradition for me, a, sort of a symbol, because no one was ever going to do that. And so recently they started cutting the income tax. So I really don't like the income tax. Um, but on the other hand, you're right. I mean, if we cut something and it's just too much, 
and suddenly uh, the revenue coming in just starts to dry up for the next administration, you're going to put a Republican supermajority in a very tough spot because, as you just mentioned, you can cut a tax, but try to get Republicans to raise a tax. Even if they're raising the tax that they just cut back to the same level, you know, it's hard. I mean, you're talking to a guy in some of my younger years before I – well, I won't say matured because I still sometimes act like a child, according to my girlfriend. But, uh, you know, back, <laughs> if you guys remember, uh, in 2016 and 17, uh, back in my radical libertarian days, um, before I found some of that uh, ideology to be indefensible and sort of idiotic, um, I, uh, almost, I think that almost, clip's going to be played over and over, Pat. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that. This is all being recorded. But I'm just being straightforward. I, uh, will, I'm i not trying to take credit for anything here, but uh, I uh, and a couple other guys who stood by me, I mean, we almost shut the government down two years in a row because we refused to raise – uh, taxes on, I think it was cigarettes. It was, you know, and uh, and a couple, and there were some other packages there. They tried reforms where they they would say lower the rate, expand the base, and that just means okay, we're going to cut like a sales tax by a quarter percent, but now we're going to tax all these other things, you know, all these other services that aren't taxed, and and we fought that tooth and nail, and that didn't pass, and we beat Republicans over the head, uh, saying. You know, you sign pledges, you never raise tax, and now you're going to go back on your word. So if you get a group of guys like that, and I was to do something like that and lead some, like, rebellious thing, and I'm not saying I'd do that, but it would be very, very difficult to, you know, raise the rate of taxes again. Um, so when we cut taxes, I'm all for it. I just want to make sure that we have a very healthy um, – state government because you know the state is very necessary in people's lives um, um uh, you know the ancients we we treat in the liberal order this the government as some sort of foreign entity like it's an alien uh organization that's outside of society you know the ancients thought the the state the leaders were just as natural to society as the family was and so um we need a strong you know state I, I believe in small government but we need good leaders we need a good laws good services and you know and that requires revenue and um i want to make sure the tax burden is as light as possible but i want to make sure we have a healthy um uh state uh government so that we can provide you know the necessary uh services especially for the average guy and gal out there who um, really requires, for example, smooth roads. So they're not, uh, you know, just having a terrible day, going to work at the steel mill or wherever, and, uh, and, and, and trashing their car through potholes after potholes. And I'm just using that as an easy example. You know, I want to make their lives better. And, uh, and that requires a little bit of revenue. And so, um, so I'm just worried a little bit, but you know, I, if the governor's comfortable and we and we sit down and we deliberate, uh, myself and some other guys uh, that are smarter than me in the legislature, and we can uh, put uh, figure out, hey, this is a good move, you know, I'm all for it then. Mr. Gilstrap. Uh, well, we're sending you a squadron, assuming the results of the uh, uh, primaries are the results in November, we're sending you a squadron of income tax abolitionists in uh, <laughs> for, for the next session. Um next year i'm just curious if you can shift gears a little bit i'm interested in your input um before the show jonathan bodwell was talking about how he thinks that biden walked away with the debate he thought he it was absolute hands down winner of of the debate and and i'm, and I'm curious what, what your thoughts are the the jill, the jill biden method. yeah you did great you did you, you stood there you answered questions oh my god you were great they weren't I, the questions being asked yeah, but you, know. you were you were great and we beat medicare you didn't know that we beat medicare i didn't know it's we were time, with medicare. you beat medicare and it's time for ice cream i might have lied oh, a little bit i'm there. on my cell phone and i'm not discerning your voices are you telling me that someone on in on your end thought biden won the, the debate we all thought that conclusively yeah I mean, of course. no brainer 
This is we're, radio. I was. I Pat, was, we're, I was Pat, we're, we're kidding. We're just <laughs> kidding. I hope you're, yes. Uh, Tongue in cheek here. No oh, brainer. Yeah. I, I saw no brain at all on him. But anyway, go ahead. No, you're, he wanted your thoughts on the debate. I only watched the first quarter of the debate and then I turned it off. Um, I just thought it was sort of ridiculous. I, sometimes if I, if I, I have, you know, this sort of side of me and I will never admit it because my old man always said, you can never cry in anything except for if you watch Rudy or Field of Dreams at the end. And that's the only time <laughs> acceptable for a man to cry. Amen to that. But I, <laughs> but I do feel Brian's song um, was pretty good. Hey, I too. cried when Jimmy Chitwood hit the shot in Hoosiers. Come on. <laughs> oh man, yeah, that yeah, Gene Hack that's a great movie too. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, but what I'm trying to get at is that I do feel sometimes very uh uh I feel bad about what they're doing to Joe Biden. You know, um, uh, but, you know, in my opinion, Joe Biden's a scumbag for decades because of he's just a known liar. And uh, if you look back at his record, um, I just uh, I despise the man. So sometimes I say, you know, maybe I shouldn't feel bad. But still, clearly, you know, he should not be doing what he's doing and his handlers and his uh, people around him. You know, it almost feels like uh, uh, a, a, a nightmarish horror version of the film Weekend at Bernie's. It's just, it's just, you know, it's, it's terrible what they're doing to him. And it, you know, you know how the, you know we have uh, conspiracy theories, you know, on the conservative side, and we get, you know, people come up with these theories and they're labeled conspiracy theories. And then it's funny in this day and age, suddenly, you know, a conspiracy theory. One year, the very next year, well, uh, it's 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 admitted in this reality, and you know, there's a few. I, I kind of thought that this unprecedented, very early presidential debate before all the conventions, it seemed like the some of the you know elites, the managerial elites uh, in our country were purposely holding this because they know that. Joe Biden probably can't make it through the campaign campaign season. They put him out there and set him up. And then look at all the corporate press afterwards. They immediately said, oh, my gosh, we're in panic mode. He's not himself. He can't do it. It just seems like they're setting him up. But maybe I'm wrong, but maybe I think they're setting him up for a replacement at the at the, at the convention and bring someone in. To, like, most de- or something. I agree, most definitely. I mean, and, yeah. I mean, they did say, you know, it was probably because he had a cold. You know, I... Yeah, right, yeah. right, a cold. A okay, cold. I get it. Yeah, the leader of the free world acts like that because he's got a cold. I think the scandal of modern times here, <clears throat> we talk about who lied about this in the debate and who lied about that, and you know, we get to these little facts. When you consider yeah. the the size of the lie that has been petu- been perpetuated by the White House for the last, certainly for the last two years. I give them a buy on the first couple of years because Biden looked like he had some vitality to him. But the shell of a man that they've, that they've been covering for, and not just the White House, but the press corps as well, perpetuating that lie by means for political purposes to keep the Democrats in the White House or to keep Trump out of the White House. You know, we got the future of the free world at stake here. We got this is this is a, a we talk about existential problems in, in one man. We're talking about somebody who who actually needs to respond to a crisis like right now. And yeah. th- that's the lie that's been perpetuated that that is the worst of my lifetime. Pat, I got 60 seconds for you to wrap it up. Go right ahead. Well, you're absolutely right. The biggest, I think, issue right now that has to be confronted in a um, in a very very prudent way, uh, very soon is the war uh, in Eastern Europe between the Russians and the Ukrainians on that border, and uh, uh, we cannot have someone in there that is not really in control of all these different agencies that they're basically trying to jockey for who's in power, and there's no coordination. And in my opinion, this is a very dangerous um, – this is very dangerous what's going on in Eastern Europe. And uh, we need to get out of that. We need to stop supplying the Ukrainians with all these weapons. The Ukrainians now 
you know, are are using our weapons, missiles and other weapons, offensive weapons, uh, to attack uh, Russians deep into their territory. And that's a red line. And I know people want to say Putin's bad and he wants to somehow reinvigorate some some Soviet empire. It's just so nonsensical. They don't understand the history of that region. And we do not want to risk nuclear war uh, over over this idiocy, over over these morons that are getting so on, on that note, Pat. Thing. I got to get going, man. Thanks. Appreciate your call. All right. Hey, hey, God bless. And sorry to keep you up a little bit later than your bedtime there, Rob. <laughs> but good conversation on philosophy, pal. You and the men's right. soccer team. Take it easy, man. Hey, all right. All right. All right. I told, I told Rob it would be five minutes, and then he reminded me it was about 30 minutes. So, uh, conversation. <laughs> Abject <laughs> lie is what that was. Oh, come on, man. Abject was, lie. You know, you get me going on ideas, and I ramble. My mother always said, Jesus. I mean, um, she hey, put her to sleep. All right. Have a good God day. God bless you guys. Have a good morning. Thanks, Take Pat. Care. That is uh, Pat McGeehan, and we are back with more after these.